Hello, good evening and welcome to Biz First Review 360, your weekly roundup of the top business stories in the country. Tonight we start off our program with a look at the tea industry. The Sri Lanka Tea Board says that it is prepared to invest 8.7 billion rupees in a global campaign to promote Ceylon tea in 2017. The Sri Lanka Tea Board is gearing to launch a three-year campaign to promote Ceylon tea in 25 markets with a first phase scheduled to kick off in March 2017. Next year we will be uh, launching a global campaign with an investment of about $35 million and uh, we hope to see a substantial improvement in uh, the consumption of Ceylon tea in the 12 markets that we are targeting once that campaign gets underway. Yeah, we are just uh, on the verge of uh, awarding our international marketing campaign and uh, I'm very uh, confident that we can do that in the next two to three months. It was held up because of certain red tape and bureaucracy. Uh, but just like I was uh, in tourism, I was able to get that marketing campaign. I was on the verge of doing it just before I left. Uh, but I'm very confident that I can, uh, have, with the help of the tea board, I can do that. The Sri Lanka Tea Board said an investment of 8.7 billion rupees will be allocated from a CES fund and the first phase will target Russia, Iran, Turkey, USA, Japan, UK, China and the UAE. The Sri Lankan tea industry is currently faced with relatively higher production costs, lower international prices and lower demand from some of its key export markets owing to low oil prices and socio-economic unrest. One thing is certain, the next 150 years uh, is not going to be the same, it's going to be different. Uh, there has to be change and uh, I would emphasize that uh, very strongly because the industry also has to uh, take cognizance of the market forces that are being now uh, we're seeing certain trends in the international markets uh, so that is something that we have to take into stock and uh, we have to bring our cost of production down, we have to bring make our yields much higher we have to ensure our quality through uh, regulation and then make sure that the regulations are followed uh, the culture and the spirit of the industry must, must be maintained, we have to have good uh, people coming into the industry, I mean, uh, vintage quality estate superintendents that were there in your time and in my father's time, I don't know whether uh, we still have them. We have to ensure that at least we retain them. Most of our, uh, so most of our key personnel are, are leaving the industry, so these are big issues. Uh, so just today we had a, a meeting in the chat by the Prime Minister where all these issues were addressed. Uh, it was about two hour meeting uh, and he appointed three committees uh, for the tea, rubber and the coconut sector and uh, we will be formulating a very cogent uh, plan uh, and presenting it to him in um, January. Unfortunately, the years that gave us a bad price had a world crisis. There was the oil crisis, there was war, there was various issues, there were sanctions on Russia, which is our most friendly country that buys a whole lot of our tea. And if you walk in Russia, you will see more Sri Lankan brands and Lanova brands than anything else. And that country has more tea shops than anywhere else in the world, maybe not China, because China has their own tea. But this country doesn't produce any tea except some little tea in Georgia and everything else is important. The Sri Lanka Tea Board said that the Tea CES Fund now had raised about 35 million US dollars which is to be invested on a global promotional campaign. The CES Fund was set up in 2011 and exporters were levied 3 rupees and 50 cents for every kilo of tea exported from Sri Lanka. However, Plantation Minister Navin Disanayaka said he is fighting attempts by the Ministry of Finance to take over the CES Fund which is made up of taxes collected from tea exporters. I feel an honest and open society that we should interact, we should debate, uh, we should look at our faults, we should look at the, the faults that uh, emanate from uh, perhaps a lack of cohesion on government policy. Uh, and all these have been debated and as you know I have been a, a vocal, a very vocal in my thinking on, on, uh, on the tea industry and where it should go. I have always stood up for the tea industry, particularly when uh, as of now I am fighting with the Treasury on the fund. 
uh, the TV fund that we have got for promotions, I, I, I fundamentally and strongly believe it should be the T board, not because it's a personal issue, but, but, but because it's a matter of principle. So I believe that uh, as far as the tea industry is concerned, we have to fight for our corner, we have to aggressively market our product and ensure that uh, new markets are opened up and ensure that the existing markets are also there. The minister made these remarks at a media conference held to announce celebrations of 150 years of Ceylon tea. We in the tea board and the Minister of Plantation Industries with the government policy, uh, we are determined to uh, make uh, Ceylon tea uh, as it was a sim symbol of quality, of purity and uh, international recognition. So we are embarking on this uh, 150 anniversary with a lot of dynamism and vigour and we want to ensure that uh, we can highlight and showcase uh, Ceylon tea for what it is. The World Bank has approved a 75 million US dollar payment to support social welfare in Sri Lanka and also to prevent fraud. The World Bank's loan facility will support Sri Lanka's main welfare programs by developing an integrated system to better manage the selection, administration and payment to beneficiaries. The World Bank said the project will contribute to improving the equity, efficiency and transparency of the social safety net. The London Stock Exchange Group opened their new technology hub in Colombo this week. Let's have a look. Opening the new state-of-the-art technology facility in Sri Lanka, the London Stock Exchange Group said it is ready to support the privatization of state-owned enterprises. We stand ready to offer our support and our expertise by supporting the privatization of state-owned companies and providing complementary liquidity in London. We want to help through market infrastructure enhancement and in the development of the sovereign bond market. We are keen to work with Sri Lanka's financial community in the economy as it continues to grow and to innovate. The new facility, headquartered in the Trace Expert City Precinct of Colombo, will provide technical support services for the group's global network. London Stock Exchange Group has extensive experience working in Sri Lanka through its global trading and technology business, Millennium IT. London Stock Exchange Group has a very special relationship with Sri Lanka. And this was due to the vision of one man, our chief executive, Xavier Rolle, who is here today. He saw the great potential the country, which he got to know through Millennium IP, has uh, and understood that a software company such as Millennium could be a world leader if it joined with our family as it did in 2009. London Stock Exchange Group is a diversified market infrastructure group powered by Millennium IT. And Millennium IT is a vital part of the group as a whole. Previously, we were employing around 800 people in Malabi and Colombo. Millennium IT's technology underpins London Stock Exchange Group's capital markets, post-trade and information services, and powers other market infrastructure companies and venues all over the world. From pre-frontier markets all the way to the most developed economies across Asia Pacific, Europe and the Americas. Our new state-of-the-art facility, formerly opened today, welcomes 400 new and talented employees to Millennium IT and creates a world-leading technology hub right here in Sri Lanka. Our commitment to this facility and our colleagues here 
and our significant investment in Sri Lanka demonstrates the enormous potential of this economy and the faith we have in your future. You all had your first investment with the Millennium Group and subsequently you've decided to come here to start this facility so that the capital market operations would to a large extent be serviced by Colombo. This is a result of the stable government, the macroeconomic stab uh, stabilization program that the government headed by Maitripala Sirisena president has introduced. Coming up on the other side of this break, a chat with the president of the US Sri Lanka Business Council. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nadim Majid. What will be the role of the newly established U.S. Sri Lanka Business Council and how will the policies of the President-elect Donald Trump impact the Sri Lankan economy? Let's have a chat with the President of the U.S. Sri Lanka Business Council. And today with us uh, we've got the President of the newly established Sri Lanka U.S. Business Council still and he is the new uh, president of the Council. Welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Samantha Rajapaksa. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, before we go into um, the more hot button issues, let's just start off by asking you what your new role is about. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has taken the initiative to form a Sri Lanka US Business Council uh, with the objective of fostering trade between Sri Lanka and US. Uh, as the first president of the association, I think my primary role is to establish the association on a very strong footing, uh, and that's where we are right now. Well, um, talking about the U.S. elections and the new president-elect's policies when it comes to trade, he seemed to have a very hostile policy towards liberalization. Uh, we saw, his, saw it during his speeches. We also saw it during his um, uh, statements that were, make, were made before the U.S. elections. Well, free markets seem to be restricted in his policy. So will this really uplift or really upset the domestic market in the future? As far as the new president is concerned, I think there's been a lot said before election. I think if you look at a Sri Lankan context, a lot is said before an election. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to reality of running a government, uh, maintaining bilateral relationships, that's a different ball game altogether. Uh, I feel it's too early to exactly predict what his trade policies would be going forward. Obviously, he's been pretty open on the fact that it's going to be very much protective of the U.S. companies. Uh, if you look at NAFTA, which he comments a lot on, that's almost a 23-year-old agreement, mm -hmm. which definitely needs a revisiting and a, maybe a renegotiation. Uh, similarly, TPP, which is on the drawing board and it's uh, in the implementation stage, uh, he has commented that he needs to revisit that. Uh, how I would look at it is Sri Lanka is a very small player in the export markets globally. And I think th the impact to us, yes, if it's affecting apparel, that would be a significant impact. Mm -hmm. But there's so much opportunity. I think with, if we can, through the association, through the Chamber of Commerce, look at fostering trade uh, effectively between our two countries, between the companies from the two countries, uh, we can definitely see opportunities still. How much of an interest uh, could you see in the investors in Sri Lanka in uh, investing in the U.S. market or vice versa? I think uh, it's not purely investment in the U.S. market, but fostering trade with the U.S. companies. If you look at uh, U.S. accounts are more than 25% of total exports mm -hmm. going out of Sri Lanka. Uh, there's about 3.2 billion U.S. dollars worth of trade which happens with U.S. Mm -hmm. So there is tremendous opportunity. And if you look at uh, sectors, uh, our main exporter, apparel, mm -hmm. uh, accounts for uh, more than three-fourths of the uh, total exports going into U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a whole range of any mark a total market which opens up. And what we 
uh, attempt to do with the association is to get the companies which are interested in doing business with U.S. Mm -hmm. Also facilitate U.S. companies who are interested to do business in Sri Lanka. Make that uh, uh, matching, uh, enable the matching of these two companies, these companies, so that we can build a good business model. Well, you spoke about fostering trade ties with the U.S. and also trade ties and the importance of it when it comes to uh, bilateral discussions. Um, what sort of a contribution will trade ties between Sri Lanka and the U.S. have uh, when it comes to uh, the macroeconomy of the country? Well, there are different, definitely if you look at Sri Lanka's economy today, we are much, very much an import-driven economy. And if you look at the pressures on the imports, it is mainly uh, as a result of a declining exports. Because each time, I think when we have a look at the national budget, it's a matter of curtailing imports because of the trade deficit. But I think one key factor which the government is also putting a lot of attention is to creating export industries, looking at FDI to generate exports. Because unless we really build up our export volume significantly, there's always going to be pressure on the trade deficit. So from a macro uh, impact point of view, I think whether it be U.S. or any other market, uh, the need to focus on exports is very critical. Well, you spoke about the budget. Has the budget really helped uh, this prospect? The government is making a lot of uh, effort to attract FDI into our country for a direct investment. Uh, there are a lot of incentives which the government has introduced this time as well to attract uh, foreign investment because we've seen uh, not so significant growth in foreign direct investment in the recent past. Mm -hmm. So we are hopeful with the changes, I think, in, from a Sri Lankan point of view, uh, where it become more conducive for foreign companies to invest in Sri Lanka. Uh, similarly, the business environment for Sri Lankan companies to venture outside and create new markets, uh, which would again have internal as well as external uh, infusion into the, com into the economy. Well, before you uh, are recognized as the president of the Sri Lanka U.S. Business Council, you would recognize yourself as a businessman. Well, being a businessman and assuming that role, uh, how do you think the government should really work on easing restrictions and red tapes? That's a, that's a very good question. I, I think that's a challenge which the government also is looking to because for a foreign investor to come in to the country, I mean, for example, Associated Motorways, where I work for, we are a foreign-owned company. Uh, there are a lot of barriers, there are a lot of restrictions put in for even a company like ours to invest in Sri Lanka. So for a company which is totally foreign to Sri Lanka, uh, for them to come in, still there are certain unknown factors. There's, I mean, the need for a one-stop shop for an investor to come in and to walk away within a couple of days with the investment already set up mm. is still far reached right now. So I know there's a lot of effort happening, but I think there is a lot, lot of more stakeholders have to really join in and support the government to really make it happen, because if not, we won't see the foreign direct investment coming in the anticipated levels. Well, we are heading into a new year. 2017. So do you think it's going to be uh, a really good year for investors, investors and businessmen? I'm always a positive person. If you look at what Sri Lanka has gone through over the past couple of decades, we've had much worse periods than this. Mm -hmm. Today, Sri Lanka is uh, a sought-after destination as far as tourism is concerned. Uh, if you look at Sri Lanka today, is one of the safest destinations in Asia. Uh, if, to, if you look at the expats who live in Sri Lanka, they love the country. Uh, we just need to fine-tune our business model. We need to fine-tune how people do business in Sri Lanka. We need to fine-tune the regulatory framework. And we need to m make Sri Lanka more welcoming and easy to do business in. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you uh, for giving your perspective about uh, the Sri Lanka U.S. Business Council and explaining to us about your role in the council. On the other side of this commercial break, we take a look at the impact of political intervention in the tea sector.
Welcome back to Biz First Review 360. Now, on last week's program, we looked at how climate change and a ban on weedy sides is threatening the tea industry. Tonight, we're going to look at how political intervention can impact the tea industry. Ceylon tea is famous for its flavour and quality the world over. In this series, we explore the threats to its future. We've already looked at its history and the risk posed by climate change and a government ban on weedicide. But what other political interventions threaten to destroy Sri Lanka's greatest export? In Sri Lanka's 2016 budget, the government announced plans to restrict the size of estates run by regional plantation companies to 5,000 acres. With these estates currently averaging 25,000 acres, this will have a dramatic impact on organisations that claim to be already making losses. The question is how reducing economies of scale of production would benefit the tea industry. So by splitting up the divisions into five, you can have a more accountable system. If you have smaller clusters, yeah, the, the, it will be easier to manage. Uh, they've had the land for the last 20 odd years. Why should they be managing the companies if they can't make money? Uh, they can't be expecting the government to be giving them handouts when the bad times are there. They have to inbuild that into their economic model. With higher rates of productivity, smallholders are often held up as an example. Despite some exporters questioning the quality of some of the tea that they produce. However, is government subsidy to smallholders unfair? Yeah, they get more. They got more from the government. Clear the jungle, they give subsidy. They to plant the tea, they give plants. And they give manure, subsidy. So they get everything. Tea, it seems, is undoubtedly political. But government intervention is not the only political force that poses a threat. Some argue union influence is not always in the industry's best interests. Ah, the politics has always been a disturbing element. When the planters and the trade unions don't come to some agreement, there is always unseen hand of government uh, coercing uh, and imposing, I mean, indirectly even some mandatory wage increases. Union, unlike any other industry, union is not separate from a political party. So there is a political agenda that drives these movements. So politicians exist because of the voters and always they'll try to uh, put the interests of the voters in front rather than the interests of the industry. In October, trade unions helped agree a 50 rupee rise to workers' basic wage plus a bonus for reaching a 22 kilo target. But how are unions viewed by the people they represent? In response, Mr. Sivalingam, MP and CWC party leader, claimed the worker was being used as propaganda by anti-union NGOs. The recent increase in wages was eventually agreed after years of negotiation and a wave of estate worker protests instigated by unions. But many workers remain bitterly disappointed at union failure to agree a higher daily wage, such as the 1,000 rupees originally suggested by unions. Is this disappointment creating distrust between workers, unions and estate management and damaging productivity? Many planters feel tea estate workers get a fair deal and point out that they earn above the average for rural Sri Lankans. However, tea plucker wages vary considerably depending on the season and how many leaves there are to pluck. On Speak Your Mind, we take a look at some highlights from the Asia Hotels and Tourism Investment Conference which was held in Colombo. Globally in 2016, travel and tourism will contribute nearly 10% of the world's GDP. 
at some $7.2 trillion. $800 billion of investment in the form of airports, seaports, roads, resorts, high-speed rail and other infrastructure. And 6% of global exports and 30% of all global service exports. Around the world, we support somewhere in the region of between 280 and 284 billion jobs, which equates to 1 in 11 jobs on the planet. This year, we expect travel and tourism to grow by about 3.5%, more than double the GDP growth of other parts of the world and other sectors. In the long term, we forecast that this trend will continue and our sector will grow by 4% each year for the next decade. And by 2026, 1 in 10 of the world's jobs will be supported by travel and tourism. Over the course of the next 10 years worldwide, the businesses which make up travel and tourism industry will need another 80 million people to work, which I think is pretty good news actually for all of us, that we will be employing more people in our industry. Yet, when I speak to the leaders of the world of travel and tourism companies, it is clear that the biggest challenge to their growth plans is the supply and retention of talent across all levels of their businesses. Research by the WTTC shows that failure to recruit and train the right people could cost the sector hundreds of billions of dollars. We are a people industry which depends on quality people to deliver a quality product to our customers. We need the right policies, programs and partnerships in place to ensure that the workforce of the future knows about the opportunities in our sector and has the appropriate skills and knowledge to support future growth. Here in Sri Lanka, I'm also pleased to see the adoption of a modern electronic travel approval platform which streamlines visit visas and at the same time enhances security. Though I would say charging $35 every time you go online to get the visa, which has to be renewed quite frequently, does seem a bit high. And it also, I ask the question, what would happen if I'm traveling with a family of three children and a wife, for example, where everybody has individual passports? Do we have to pay 35 per person? It's a question, not a statement. And that's a wrap of our program tonight. Don't forget to look us up on Facebook. You'll find us at BizFirst Review 360. That's 1ST and 360 in numerals. I'm Nadim Majid. I'll see you again same time, same place next week. Good night and good luck.